I'm here today to tell you about the recent discovery that's going to change the way you see the world. During the last two decades, the alien race of Tulo have been living among us. Their aim is to infiltrate society and make Earth their own. You do not believe me. <laughs> Neither do I. The reason I said this would used to get your attention, what professional presenters call a hook. But your reaction to this nonsense is still important. You do not believe that aliens are living among us. Why? Well, the simple explanation is because you're human beings. And as human beings, you're capable of intelligent reasoning. The thing that makes this intelligent is that you do not actually know this. The person sitting next to you might not actually be from Stockholm. She might actually call the planet of Tatooine her home. <laughs> Intelligence sometimes scares us. The idea of an alien race living among us is frightening. It's frightening because it implies that a very capable intelligence, which might not share any kinds of sympathies towards the human race, nor share our human values. But let's replace the green men with ships of silicone. And we get a story which we can often read in the papers. It tells about the future where machine intelligence will overtake us and slave us. Where scientists like me are creating the very technologies that are realizing this. This talk is going to be about intelligence. I'm going to give you my views and opinions of what it means to be intelligent for a machine and for a human. And I do hope that I'm going to convince you not only about my own harmlessness, but also that the future is not one of doom and gloom, but something rather exciting. So without further ado, enter the pink elephant. What is intelligence? Well, the only thing that we really know is that intelligence is something that humans possess. So therefore, let me introduce to you my favorite intelligence. This is my godson, Eric. <laughs> Eric grows up on a farm. And on a visit to Stockholm, we were out walking. Or let me rephrase that. I was out walking because Eric is a very intelligent young man. So he convinced me that it's much better for him to sit on my shoulders. <laughs> While walking, I point out a car. Look, Eric, it's a really nice car. That's a Ferrari. A little bit later, during our walk, Eric gets my attention. Uncle Carl, look, another Ferrari. This car was of a different model, of a different color, but still Eric was capable of understanding that both these cars share the same Italian car genetics. This is an example of reasoning under large uncertainty, where a single example of this car enabled Eric to build an abstract model of what it means to be a Ferrari, what visually makes it similar and what makes it different to other cars. I'm sure when Eric came home, he had one or two things to say about the family's Volvo. <laughs> Ever since the dawn of computers, there has been this idea about artificial intelligence, that somehow computers should be able to mimic Eric's behavior. From modest beginnings, we've seen a very impressive development. In the 1950s, computers learned how to play checkers. 40 years later, the computer Deep Blue beat the reigning world champion in chess. And just four years ago, a computer won Jeopardy. This is a very impressive set of developments, and it raises lots of questions. Where will we be in five years? where we will be in 50 years. Should we be afraid of this? Is this truly artificial intelligence? Well, to be able to understand this, we need to look at what artificial intelligence actually is. The idea of this is based on a notion that intelligence is computational. What this means is we observe the world with our senses. Then we have memories. 
memories of our previous experiences and things that we've done. These two sources of information go into a computational process, and the output is somehow intelligent. The idea is that this is how the brain works. And if the brain works like this, if it is truly computational, we should be able to mimic this behavior in the logical circuit of a computer. So I am a machine learning scientist. This means I'm trying to build these systems. So my work looks a little bit like this. First, I try to understand what it means to be intelligent. Then, I have to make this notion of intelligence explicit. I have to formulate it in a language. Once it's formulated inside a language, it can be transferred to the logic of a computer. If this chain can somehow be connected, the idea is that we would have artificial intelligence. So importantly, what I do is really about language. And to me, that's actually what science truly is. Science is about formulating knowledge explicitly inside a language and therefore creating understanding. But here comes a big misunderstanding that I often find my students doing. Science is about language, but the phenomena it describes is not governed by the language. Gravity is not a mathematical concept, but gravity can be well explained by mathematics. I would like to quote the poet Mural Reuxer. She says, the universe is made of stories, not atoms. And just as Einstein provided a different narrative to that of Newton, I am sure that the idea and stories of gravitation will continue to evolve. The important things with working with languages and any kind of explicit knowledge is that as soon as I formulate something, it would lose some of its freedom because now the information will have to adhere to the structures and rules defined by the language. Let me try and explain this. I love cheese. And I can try to explain to you the pleasure that runs through my veins when I indulge in my favorite Shropshire. However, as soon as I try and make this explicit, it loses some of its value. I can try and use different narratives. One from chemistry might allow you to understand other foods that I might like. I can use a religious connotation, and from that you might be able to understand the strength of my emotion. But importantly, none of these are what I actually feel, because language does not describe, language, language does not create, language describes, and a description is very rarely the truth. So what does this mean for my actual work? Well, in terms of computational intelligence, we began with saying that the only thing we really know about intelligence is that we have it. So without making any big claims, I'm a human, therefore intelligent. This means that I have to try and figure out how I reason about something. That's a rather hard thing, because my intelligent processes are hidden to me. They are latent. Secondly, I have to try and figure out myself with myself, which is a rather tricky thing. Secondly, I have to try and formulate this in a language, and not just any language, a language that's computational, a language that a computer can understand. If I tell you, I love my dog, or I love my parents, you all understand exactly what I mean. That is a very, very hard concept for a computer to understand. Love is not something easy for us, but it's much, much harder for a computer. To me, it's mostly clear the difference between human and machine intelligence when I lecture. So I have the benefit of working with some exceptionally clever people. And they often surprise me, nearly all the time. When I give a lecture, it's very rare that I leave and not having been surprised. The way people connect information, the intuitions they have, how they use knowledge to build something new, always surprises me. I'm yet to be surprised by a machine. I'm very often impressed, but impressed and surprised are two very different things. So does this mean that machines have less capabilities than men? No, because capability and intelligence are two very different things. 
Intelligence creates capabilities, but there's very many capabilities that do not require intelligence. So this development we saw in the beginning, where does it come from? Well, what has happened recently is that now computers are able to use enormous amounts of data. It also has the computational power to exploit that data. And what this means is that it can circumvent the need for intelligence. For a computer, it's completely feasible to remember every Ferrari, every model, in every color, in every pose. When it does that, it reduces the uncertainty to such a level where intelligence is no longer needed. For Eric, that's not possible. He can't do that, which means he requires to reason intelligently. We've seen plenty of evidence of the amazing things that computers can do in presence of big data. Amazon provides me with better book recommendations than any book salesman I've ever met. Google self-driving cars are truly less error-prone than a human driver, and computers are better at Jeopardy. But these are not the intelligences that we're scared of. These are not what's feeding our fear. What we fear is a machine that's capable of creating new and novel knowledge, what's known as the sentient AI, something that's self-aware. But this is not at all what we have created. This is not at all what we have. What we really have is used an incredibly fast librarian that have access to every book ever written. So to me, where does this fear of AI actually come from? Well, it comes from, again, using the wrong language. It comes from a problem with narrative. Because the narrative that's creating fear is only using the outcome. It's not using the source. Because if I think of what we actually know about intelligence, pretty much nothing has changed from when we did checkers to when we solved Watson. The only thing that has really enabled this mostly is data. And if you look at the most impressive results that we are creating at the moment, the ones that are actually generating this fear, they're decade old. The algorithms that use them are decades old. And actually, they are less intelligent in my book because they have to use enormous amounts of data, but they are capable of doing so. So to me, the fear of intelligence comes from a too simplistic narrative. A narrative that doesn't allow you to understand what intelligence truly is, nor what computational machines really are. I'm not afraid of machine intelligence. The same way as I'm not afraid of a car because it can drive, nor a plane because it can fly. These are great capabilities that I do not have, and they've made my life much richer. What I am afraid of is a drunk driver and a terrorist sitting behind the wheel of a plane. I'm afraid of the human that controls machine intelligence. Or more specifically, I'm afraid of the human that controls the data, because data is the thing that enables machine intelligence currently. And I'm afraid of the society that we seem to be creating at the moment, where all of us are freely, without thinking, sharing our private information without even knowing the power of this. And we share this to a few entities that are not under democratic governance. This scares me. So what will the future be like? The French philosopher Derrida talks about two futures. The future, which is something that I can imagine, and the unimaginable future, l'avenir. I believe machine intelligence will take us to the future much quicker. We will have self-driving cars. We know that. It's the future. And machine intelligence will take us there faster. It will help us to iron out the quirks. The more interesting one, l'avenir, will require a very, very abstract way of thinking. It will require to be able to connect seemingly unconnected sources of information and knowledge to create something truly novel. To me, these are fundamentally human characteristics. So, what we should see is not 
computers and machine intelligence as something competing with each other. These are two completely different things. And if we really want to empower ourselves, we should exploit the benefits that they give us and focus on what we're really good at. Because we are really good at being intelligent without actually knowing how, why, or what we're doing. Remember, I might be wrong. This is just one narrative. An implicit, explicit formulation of my thoughts, limited by English as a language and TED as a format. But within these confinements, it is what I, uh, it is what I believe as close to what my capabilities allowed me to express. Thank you.